Welcome back to another crash course where I pick a topic and pull out the most important bits of information that you need to get started. Today we'll be talking about the differences between Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems and how these differences can affect you as a programmer. So in order to understand these differences, we first must take a trip to the past and have a quick history lesson. The history of computers dates way, way back to the 1930s when a man named George Stibitz and others were working at Bell Labs on something called Boolean logic. Now, we could go all the way back to that point and start there, but I don't think that that's really relevant to us today. What is relevant, though, is the personal computing revolution, because it is the reason why we as programmers today have to deal with these three different operating systems when we're writing code. Now, why do you need to understand your operating system though? Why can't you just program on your Mac and call it a day? Well, the reason being is because you'll be working with programmers, most likely, that operate different systems. So you'll have a group of programmers uh, coding on Windows and a group on Mac, and then if you've ever used a virtual machine, practically all virtual machines run a Linux distribution. So at some point, you're probably going to have to touch one of the three, um, or more than one of the three operating systems. So to understand this, we start our story back in the 1960s at AT&T's Bell Labs. Now, Bell Labs is now owned by Nokia as of 2016, but back then it was owned by AT&T. And this company, along with MIT and General Electric, were developing something called Multics, or in other words, Multiplexed Information and Computer Services. So they were trying to create this operating system, Multics, for the General Electric version 645. This was just a piece of hardware, and if you see on the screen right here in the background, that would have probably been the GE 645. So back in these days, you have to remember that operating systems did not just come out of the box and you could just download it to a computer. You had to develop um, custom software to run each new piece of hardware. So that big machine in the background had to be custom coded if we wanted to type commands into a terminal and get it to do anything. As you might guess, the project was huge and many of the developers actually started leaving the project because of how complex it was. But Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Douglas McElroy, Joe Osana, and probably others that I haven't mentioned stayed on the project longest and eventually broke away to start their own smaller scale project, which was called Unix for Uniplexed Information and Computing Services. And this was kind of making fun of the original Multics um, because of how complex it was, but that was kind of how the Unix uh, acronym that does not really stand for anything um, came about. And so they were trying to make this smaller scale project um, compat compatible with the PDP-11 um, hardware. So at this point, let's just take a step back and think about this. So nowadays, people like myself and I'm guessing most of the viewers have not been part of this computer, personal computer revolution. So it's really hard to understand the origins of how we got to all these different operating systems. People often get Unix, Unix-based, and Linux messed up in terms of terminology. So we'll cover all of this a little bit later, but for now, just remember that what these guys were doing right here was developing the original Unix operating system. And this would come to be the basis of almost every operating system to come in the future. So in 1975, Ken Thompson took a little break and went to the University of California, Berkeley as a visiting professor. Um, he helped them install Unix version 6, and that year, or actually in 1978, won BSD, or BSD stands for Berkeley Software Distribution, um, 
it was released in 1978. And this was a Unix-based operating system. So in other words, it was just a fancy way of saying that they took the original Unix and made a few tweaks and released it as their own um, BSD or Berkeley software distribution. Also going on in 1978, Steve Jobs and his team released Apple's first operating system um, called Apple DOS 3.1. Now this has nothing to do with Unix at the time. It wasn't until 2000 when Mac started running the Darwin um, uh, distribution which was Unix based. And nowadays if you use Mac OS X that is what we call a Unix based operating system. So then in 1983 Microsoft enters the scene. So this is where the operating system wars kind of starts to get interesting. In 1983 Windows released the first version, um, or Microsoft, excuse me, released the first version of the Windows operating system, which was a multitasking operating system with a very simple graphical user interface. Previously, in 1980, Microsoft had released MS-DOS, but as many people know, that was a really... Um, primitive solution to personal computing because it had no graphical user interface. So you can kind of think of Windows, the Windows operating system, as the front end of the MS-DOS back end. So Windows plus MS-DOS pretty much equals what we um, think of as the Windows operating system. During this time and moving into the time closer to 1985, um, companies were getting pretty competitive with this whole operating system stuff. IBM was one of those, and previously Microsoft and IBM had been kind of collaborating because Microsoft was developing the operating system and IBM had the mainframe computer that the operating system was going to be um, coded for. But during the release in 1983, um, IBM kind of got a bad taste in their mouth and started working on their own operating system. This was also the year that the GNU project was started by a guy named Richard Stallman at MIT. And this was a huge, um, huge moment in open source computing history because uh, this project that Richard was working on was had the goal of creating an operating system that would be completely free um, and open for the public. So in other words, it had all the components necessary to run an operating system um, for free. So come 1988, various companies were coding Unix operating systems for various hardware devices. By this point, um, Unix had basically become the de facto uh, or the standard operating system because it was manufacturer neutral. You know, you had Microsoft developing Windows and uh, Apple developing um, Apple DOS, but those were not good enough for the open source community because obviously they were proprietary and you couldn't see the code of them. So Unix kind of became the de facto um, operating system of this time. And you might be wondering, you know, how did this kind of get out into the open? You know, who released Unix? I thought AT&T at Bell Labs um, was the original creator. Well, from what I understand, did some brief research on this, um, Unix was kind of uh, distributed out to many different people because at the time, AT&T was facing lawsuits relating to antitrust legislation and basically had to release it to anyone who asked them for it. So come 1988, that's why all of these different companies were working on these Unix-based operating systems. And by that time, it was getting hard to kind of create a standard. Um, and the goal was to create a simple um, specification that these Unix um, operating systems could kind of compile down to so that we didn't have to have a different operating system for every single different hardware device. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Computer Society, 
or what we now just call the Computer Society or the IEEE, um, felt that it was necessary to create that set of standards to allow what we call portability of operating systems. Or in other words, we can download an operating system and put it on any hardware device that we want. So this computer society developed what we call the POSIX standard, which was a set of standards for processes, um, signals, file operations, pipes, the C standard library that we can still use today, um, IO ports, and finally, what we call a shell. This leads us into 1989, where Brian Fox, who was part of the GNU project led by Richard Stallman, as we talked about a little bit earlier, he was working on an upgraded version of the SH shell. So that the SH specification was the original um, shell, or what we think of as like a terminal, um, for the Unix operating system. And what Brian Fox did was create the born again shell, which was just an upgraded version of this, and we now call it Bash today. We'll kind of get into why I'm bringing this up and how it's so important to us as programmers a little bit later. But for now, you can kind of see how all of this software was becoming more and more open source and available to the public. To cap it off, in 1989, Richard Stallman also released the GNU public license which you may say, okay, that's super boring. It's just a bunch of text that, um, a bunch of legal text that specifies who can use what software. But in reality, that license was a huge moment in the history of open source software because it defined how we could create software for um, many people across the world. And the icing on the cake happened in 1991. So at this point, the GNU project, uh, led by Richard Stallman, had created many of the computer components necessary for an entirely open operating system. But the only thing that was missing was the kernel. You can kind of go look up what, the, what a kernel is uh, on your own time. It's, it's very similar to a central processing unit, but I'm not going to get into that. So at this point, we had all the pieces except the kernel. Frustrated by this, Linus Torvalds, the guy in the picture right here, um, he created the Linux kernel, which was an open source operating system that was pieced together with the other parts that the GNU project had um, kind of collaborated on into a fully open source operating system. So really, the Linux uh, kernel is not an entire operating system and it can kind of be paired with many different pieces um, and that's kind of why we see so many different distributions of this today. So fast forward to today and based on the general consensus that I came to with a quick Google search, it shows that about 75% of the operating system market is Windows. And you might be wondering, why is this the case? You know, why is there so many Windows operating systems out there? We know that Windows is notorious for its malware, followed by subsequent um, Windows updates to fix that uh, malware. And so why do so many people like it? Well, it's not that Windows is the best operating system. It's just the best solution for the most people. So let's go through this by the process of elimination. So we'll start with the Chrome OS because that's kind of an outlier. Chrome OS was more of a recent thing, so we don't have to worry about that. That is simply for their Chromebooks and I'm sure other things. Now let's move on to Mac OS. So why is Mac, why does Mac not have a bigger market share? Well, the reason being is because number one, it's extremely expensive. You know how much it costs to buy a MacBook Pro these days. And number two, it is very proprietary and cannot be loaded onto any computer like the Windows operating system can. Now we go over to Linux and you might say, oh, well that's open to everyone. We can download Linux on any 
computer that we want. But the problem with Linux is it's too difficult for the average person to use. And therefore, it is not quite as popular. So in the end, Windows is really the winner because it is fairly priced and you can put it on pretty much any piece of hardware that you want. So that's kind of how we got to where we are today. And hopefully this brief history lesson opens up your eyes to, to better understand why we have to uh, code for these cross platforms. Although things are getting a little bit easier as developers have created these bridges between the three operating systems, we still do have to deal with this on a daily basis. To better understand how these operating systems will affect us as programmers, we will start with the differences in their file systems. Now with file systems, we could get extremely detailed in our comparison between the three and start talking about topics like encryption, file compression, um, permission sets, timestamps, um, access control lists, uh, checksums and maximum file sizes and uh, external drive sizes. These are all very important topics to file systems, but only if you are either creating a file system or you are like a systems admin. So that's just a very small subset of um, the people probably watching this. And for the most of us, we don't necessarily care about all of those details. But what we do care about um, is how these different file systems affect us when we're actually programming and navigating through the terminal. In the end, file systems is about one thing, and that is how do we handle um, all of these things that can be plugged into our computer through all the ports. So if we had an external hard drive or um, a CD-ROM or a flash drive or God forbid a um, floppy disk, these all need to um, kind of come together into one cohesive file system. And they all actually could have different file systems. If you were to kind of right click and do the get info on your one of your drives, you could see which file system it's running. Lay down on the slide here are the three operating systems and their respective file systems. So as you can see, Mac has released their newest file system, APFS, or Apple File System, um, just recently in 2017 to improve on the old one, HFS Plus. In, on the contrary, you've got Windows, who is still using NTFS, or the new technology file system, that was re released all the way back in 1993. As they say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And finally, you have Linux, which came out with EXT4 in 2006. Now notice I laid out a column on the right that says, does it use a drive, or the concept of drives? And as you might have noticed, Windows is the only file system that does so. We'll see what this means in a second. If you look on the left, the NTFS Windows file system, you can see that there is the concept of drives. So you have the C drive and the D drive. So what's significant about this is each of those drives has um, a topmost directory. So with the Windows system or the, the NTFS file system, you don't have a single root directory like you do over on the Mac. As you can see, we have this little um, forward slash which indicates that the Mac has the uh, one single root directory. Now if we jump over to the Linux file system, you can see that same concept of the root file directory. And what we call this is the everything is a file paradigm. So in other words, everything including your externally mounted um, hard drives and USB sticks are considered a folder or a file. And for the Linux system, particularly, 
if we go over to the root and then slash dev, that's where you would find all of your externally um, mounted hard drives. Up on my screen, you can see a command prompt and the file explorer for a Windows virtual machine that's running on my Mac right now. So this virtual machine has all of the files that exist on my Mac, which is the computer that I'm running, um, except the one difference will demonstrate the difference between the file systems perfectly. So I've got a bunch of external drives. Um, for example, the external drive on Mac, that's like my big um, external hard drive and then you have Transcend which is also an external hard drive as well as the Parallels desktop that's the VM that's running and then this kind of virtual view called Home on Mac. So the Z drive is where I'd actually find all of my files and folders. Now in the command prompt this is significant because if you're working on Windows and you type cd forward slash, that's going to take you to the root of something, but it's not the root of the entire computer. So when I typed that, I just got to the root of this particular C drive, but if I wanted to go to the root of another drive, I'd have to first enter it. So maybe I want to go to uh, the home drive, so Z. Actually, I don't type cd, so just type Z colon and clear the screen and now I'm in my the root of my Z drive so as you can see with this Windows file system the NTFS we don't have the concept of a single root directory like we do on Linux and Mac so we'll take a step over to my um, Mac which see we have switched the screen and we're no longer in the virtual machine this is actually my computer and you can see that on the left, we have these um, drives, but they're not considered drives. They're considered locations. And this is significant because if we go to the terminal and type cd forward slash, I'm already there, but we go to the top most directory or the root directory, we are actually at the top of our entire file system. So if we don't need to switch drives to get to these different external hard drives. All we need to do is go to cd forward slash volumes and then type in whatever external drive it is that I want to get to. And that's how you navigate around. Now, this is very similar to how Linux works, and I'm not even going to show the Linux file system because it is so similar. Um, so if we go to cd forward slash again, um, you can actually find all of these external drives either under the volumes um, or, as you would see on a Linux machine, they would exist in the dev folder. So if we go to cd dev and then ls that out, that's going to show us all the things that are on my computer. And if we scroll all the way up to where we see the disk, listed out. These are actually these locations on the left. So I believe like disk number four would be the Zach external drive. Could be wrong on that. But um, we could type in something like disk util list and that's going to show us you know basically what all of these external disks are and the location. So go back to that disk four that I was talking about um, and it looks like that is not the one. So the external drive would have been disk three. And you can see it's an external physical drive and it's running the Apple HFS file system, which is actually the old file system that Apple uses. To wrap up our discussion on file systems, there's truly only a few things that you need to understand as a programmer to not get lost between the three operating systems. Just consider the Mac and the Linux file systems, uh, which would be the APFS and EXT4. These are very similar and for the most part, aside from um, all those technical details that 
uh, we don't really need to know about, they're essentially the same and they'll work the same um, for all intents and purposes. Now, if we go over to Windows, we have a different story because when we're in the command prompt, we'll have to be navigating between different drives um, to get around. So that's the basics of the file system. Hopefully, um, it kind of clears up a few questions that you might have had. Now that you have a brief understanding of the different operating systems, file systems, we can move on to the topic of command line interpreters or shells. Now listed on the screen are the three operating systems and their default shells. And immediately you might notice that Mac and Linux, as with the file systems that were so similar, also run the same default shell of Bash. So if we take it back to our original history lesson, um, Brian Fox in 1989 was working on this thing called the Born Again Shell, or Bash, for the GNU project. This extended and improved on the original S8 shell that had come with the Unix systems. We'll get into that in just a second. But Windows, on the other hand, does not run a Bash shell. It runs something called command.exe. There really is no particular name for the shell other than command.exe, um, so that's a little bit unique to Windows. Before we jump into the actual demonstration of the different shells, I think it's important to understand what a shell is, because these days when we don't actually have the physical separation of these different components, we get terms like terminal, console, um, command line interpreter, shell, etc., all confused, and we don't really understand what's going on. On the left, we have a terminal, which is essentially just a graphical user interface for typing text commands that will eventually be run on the operating system, which we see on the far right. Now, in order for this to work, we need something to interpret these text commands and compile them down into the ones and zeros that the operating system will run. And that is the job of the shell, or the command line interpreter. In this case, we're talking about a Mac, so it would be the bash shell. So, the process that it follows is it takes a text command from the terminal to standard in, then it takes that text command, converts it to an operating system command, and then that um, operating system will do something and return a value to either standard out or standard error, which will be printed in the terminal. Now, instead of trying to conceptualize this, let's just break out of the presentation and open up my iTerm, which will show us how this is working. So if we type clear, um, we can see that if we type something like echo, this will print to the screen and press enter, we will see an output right here. So in other words, this line right here where we wrote the actual command that was written to standard in, interpreted by the bash shell, and then the operating system um, returned a value which the bash shell again printed to standard out as this uh, area right here. So that's just a bare bones explanation of how the shell works and it does work very similarly on Windows, the actual process that is happening. Now what is different between the Linux and Mac versus Windows is the actual commands that you'll be typing. So um, if we type stuff like ls, we can see all the files and folders in the current directory, and we can type pwd to see where we're at in the file system. We can type maybe cat um, a test file out, and then type clear to clear the terminal. If we now come over to the Windows 10 command prompt, we can see exactly what I mean. So the first thing that you might notice is rather than using these uh, forward slashes, we're using 
these backslashes to indicate our relative file paths. Um, to me, as a Mac user, and um, I, I generally don't program on Windows at all, this is really clunky to me to have to type, you know, the forward slash to navigate around. But also, what is different is all the commands that you're using. So you might say, oh, let me print out all the files in this current directory with ls. Well, that's not recognized in the command prompt on Windows. So instead, we have to type dir to do the same thing. Likewise, if we wanted to clear the screen, we can't just type clear, we have to type CLS. So these are differences that can certainly be learned, but as you can see, there is a benefit to using Bash um, across all of your systems because we have to use Bash at some point. If you're doing any sort of work on a virtual private server. So in other words, if you have an Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure um, server, you'll have to manage that server with the bash um, commands. So it's useful to know bash no matter what system you're running. And for that reason, Windows 10 has introduced something called the subsystem for Linux. And I have this installed and enabled on this particular um, virtual machine. And if you're a Windows user wanting to switch over to Bash, just to make your life easier in general, you can check out this video up in the top right corner. So I'll show you how this works. All I do is type Bash into the Windows command prompt. And what it's going to do is throw me into a Bash terminal. Now in that video that I um, uh, linked to, it'll describe how this works a little bit more, but basically now we can type uh, all of the bash commands that we could type on a Linux or a Mac. The last thing that I wanted to mention before we move on from the topic of shells is this uh, never ending confusion that developers and programmers seem to have with the sh versus the bash shell. So as we know from our little history lesson, the sh shell was the original um, specification for the Unix operating system. And in 1989, the born again shell or bash shell um, kind of replaced it as the better solution. So we still have backwards compatibility to the sh um, specification and you'll see this within many of your Unix based operating systems like the Mac. So I've typed out this little script. Um, so in my current directory I have created a test script.sh and notice we're calling it .sh not bash. If we use the vim text editor to edit this file we can see that all this script does is type the command echo i in the script. So basically it's printing to standard out this phrase right here. But what's tricky is at the top we have this little line that's called the shebang. And what this tells the script is where do we find the shell interpreter to run this script. And we can put the user bin sh to refer to the original not the bash, but the sh shell. And in most systems, this sh executable is actually a symlink to the bash shell. Now it's not always the case, but in many cases that is what is happening. So we could type sh up here in the shebang, and if we exit out of here and type sh test script.sh, it will run it. We could also t say bash, test script.sh, which will run the same script. And we can finally go into the script again, change this shebang to say, instead of sh, it'll say bash, exit out. And once again, we run it the same two ways and we have no problems. So there is a subtle difference but I think this is a pretty popular Stack Overflow topic that people get confused about. You know, what's the difference between SH and Bash? 
for all intents and purposes, there really is no difference. Um, there are only going to be very um, unique occasions where you'll have to worry about this. All right, so we've covered the topic of shells. And the last thing that I feel is very important for us as programmers to, to grasp when it comes to these three operating systems is that of package management. Now, if you've done any sort of programming, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. But I wanted to briefly highlight the three um, kind of default or de facto pa package managers that these three operating systems use. And unlike the topic of file systems and um, shells, the Mac and Linux operating systems actually run very different package managers. And of course, Windows has its own as well. So let's quickly dive into these different package managers and kind of see how they work. On my screen, you can see the three different operating system terminals, um, all running a different uh, package management software. So we'll start with Windows, which is on the left. Now say what we're going to do for this demonstration is install the Vim text editor on each of these systems. So what is Vim? Well, Vim is simply um, an in, uh, in-terminal text editor. So rather than something like Sublime Text, VS Code, or Atom, which are much more complex and feature-rich text editors, the Vim text editor is a lot simpler and it's for easy, quick um, edits to files that you might want to do. So in the user's Zach directory, I can type dir to see that I have this test file.txt. Now if I wanted to see what was in that file and quickly edit it, I would type vim test file.txt and it's going to say vim is not recognized as an internal or external command because I don't have it installed. So clear the screen and then using our chocolatey um, package manager, which is what the default for is Windows, we say choco install vim. It says that vim has successfully been installed. So let's clear the screen, print out our current directory, make sure we still have the test file there, and then we type vim test file.txt. And now we are entered into the vim terminal and we can add whatever text we want. So some text and then let's see if we can save and exit. Moving on to the right side of my screen, this top little window is my Mac. So to install Vim on my Mac, we use the homebrew, homebrew package management software. And we type brew install Vim. You can see that it completed and it put the Vim um, software in the path user local seller, which is where basically all of the homebrew packages are stored. And so now if we wanted to edit files with Vim, we could do so. So Vim test script, and we are in that test script that we looked at earlier. And finally, we'll go to a Linux machine. And this is a little bit confusing. So I've got a virtual machine on the left side of the screen. I've got my computer on the top right. And then I have a virtual private server, which is running um, through DigitalOcean somewhere out in New York or something on the bottom right. So I, I run a golf site and this is the virtual private server that I would use for that. And so this is a Linux machine and to install Vim here, what we type is sudo for elevated privileges, apt-get, which is the package manager, and install Vim. And it looks like that installed. So we can now edit a test.txt file and add some text and save it and quit. So 
Pretty cool. This is how we use the three package managers. And of course, if you are um, a coder, you won't have to use all three of these probably. But it is nice to know, like, you know, what the other developers who are using um, a different system from you are actually using. To wrap things up, I just wanted to kind of review what we learned in this video and recap what all this means for you as a programmer. So of course, understanding operating systems when it comes to file systems, command line uh, interpreters, and package management software. You don't necessarily need to understand all of these differences, but it truly does open up a lot of doors when you understand what the developer um, on your team that's running Windows is using while you're programming on a Mac. You can kind of understand, you know, what's going through their heads when they're programming on their computers. Now, if I had to recommend any particular operating system, I don't think that I would favor any one in particular, but there is one thing that I would favor um, through and through, and that is the Bash uh, shell. Now the reason for this is if you're on Windows and you're using the command.exe, it's going to be very difficult for you to constantly be translating from the commands that you run in that shell versus the commands that you're running in a Unix-based operating system um, environment. So if you're running any sort of machines like a virtual private server, um, on like DigitalOcean or AWS or Microsoft Azure, you're probably going to have to run Bash at some point. So it just logically makes sense that you would use Bash as your base shell scripting language. And the good thing on Windows, you can download the subsystem for Linux and everything runs pretty much exactly the same, except instead of trying to translate all of your bash commands into the Windows commands, you can just write bash code on all three operating systems. Of course, you could ignore my um, recommendations, and if you've used Windows for long enough and you're just that is just ingrained in your brain, then there's really no reason to switch. But if you're kind of just starting out, and you're trying to determine, you know, what scripting language should I focus my time on? Um, what shell commands should I be learning? I would definitely say that Bash is the way to go, just because it is cross-compatible across all three of these operating systems. If you liked this video, found it informative, please be sure to hit that like button. It really helps me out and it helps other people who may be interested in this stuff find these videos. Thank you for watching.